Father in heaven, we come asking for your Holy Spirit. We ask for light and understanding um, that, Lord, we may become strong in your word. Grant us this blessing, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so we've been looking at the parameters of uh, the parable teaching methodology, um, the various principles involved. One that we've spent a lot of time covering was this concept of uh, compare and contrast. And um, we saw that we looked at a number of examples of it using different symbols in God's word and we left off with this illustration here which showed us that uh, we can we can compare and contrast not only uh, the symbols as presented in the text but the histories of the prophetic symbols uh, that are presented in the text. We saw that the king of the north um, has a history in Daniel 11 verse 40. This is Daniel 11 verse 40 that we've laid out, the king of the north and the king of the south. And in Daniel 11 verse 40, there's a deadly wound that is arrived at at the time of the end. The end of a period of supremacy for the king of the north. And um, when we look at the conflict that led up to this deadly wound, we mark its beginning in 1796. And we can't separate, as we see in Daniel chapter 2, you cannot separate uh, a king and a kingdom. They, they are connected, right? So we see 1798, the deadly wound is suffered um, as the uh, Pope is taken captive and also as the papacy, as the papacy um, its civil authority is taken away from it and Italy is declared to be a republic. 1799, we see the Pope himself dying um, and Revelation 13 tells us that those who lead into captivity must go into captivity. So the captivity was 1798. It also says those who kill with the sword must die by the sword and the Pope died in 1799. Um, And as, <clears throat> as we look at the history of the King of the North, we understand that he will, uh, he will resurrect. And in that resurrection, he looks different from, he is resurrecting as modern Babylon, not as the papacy during the Dark Ages. So it, modern Babylon looks different. Um, it's represented as a threefold union. And we see different civil powers, you know, that are involved in uh, doing the work of, um, of, of enforcing its, 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 its beliefs, enforcing its doctrines. So modern Babylon, resurrected Babylon, looks different from uh, the papacy of the Dark Ages. As, and my brother pointed out that when we look at the natural, there's a principle that we can see where uh, when you're resurrected, you're resurrected with a new body, right, in the in the resurrection, right? So um, Lazarus was resurrected with a new body, uh, a healthy body that wasn't, right? So when you look at that concept and we apply that here, uh, when we compare and contrast that with the history of the king of the south, we see something that has been the strength of the parable teaching methodology, which is the ability to generate information that is not uh, presented within the text, right? The King of the South comes into existence in 1917. Uh, the battle that leads to his fall is the Cold War, which we mark in 1945. And um, 1989, we see the King of the South suffering a deadly wound at the time of the end. And um, in this deadly wound, the Berlin Wall falls, and this marks the beginning of a progressive uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. It's not only a progressive dissolution of the Soviet Union, but it's the loss of power uh, of by 
Gorbachev himself as the, as the premier of the Soviet Union. Then in 1991, we see a symbolic death, uh, not only of the Soviet Union, but Gorbachev himself had to resign. So based on the model above, we know that the King of the South is going to have a resurrection. But in this resurrection, as we see above, it's going to look different from what we see here in um, uh, what from the King of the South as represented by the Soviet Union. We mark this resurrection as the uh, Russia as it is as it is today, right? When Babylon resurrects, the world wanders after the beast. The King of the South has resurrected. This resurrection has been championed by uh, Vladimir Putin, right? And the world is wandering as Russia has, you know, almost suddenly emerged to a position of power to challenge the United States almost out of nowhere, apparently, right? Uh, and, but it looks different. It's not Soviet. It's not communistic or atheistic. It's now a nationalist Christian Orthodox under Putin, although there are still some parallels that you can see. Uh, in terms of how the Soviet Union was run and how Russia is run today, right? And this information we said helps us to understand, um, helps us to better understand the information we're presented with in Daniel 11, 5 to 16, the battles of Rafi and Panium. Um, okay, uh, how so? Because we had initially thought when we saw that, you know, the conflict between the King of the North and the King of the South is ongoing, that we must have made a mistake when we identified the death of the King of the South in 1989 and 9-11. Um, but we see that we made no mistakes. The King of the South did die in 1991, but he's resurrected um, in our time with the election of uh, Putin. The beginning of his resurrection with, the right, with Putin in 2000. So that is a recap of what we covered last time. And today I want to begin our consideration of another concept, another principle, uh, which is that of the natural illustrating the spiritual. When you look at the definition of a parable, the definition of a parable as we found it in Thayer's, it says, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now we're going to unpack that because we want to understand what that looks like operationalized in God's word, yes? What does that look like operationalized in God's word? story with the heavenly meaning and um, how else did we express the same concept we can use the language that it is a natural story, right? That is illustrating a spiritual truth.
I'd like us to read the Spirit of Prophecy passage that elaborates on this. It's from Christ's Object Lessons, page 17 to 18. Christ's Object Lessons, page 17 to 18. So Christ's Object Lessons, page 17, paragraph 2. It says, the scripture says, All these things spake Jesus unto them, unto the multitude in parables, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things, which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Natural things were the medium for the spiritual. That's what we've said. Um, parables are natural things that are illustrating spiritual truths. They are the medium by which spiritual truth is communicated. The things of nature and the life experience of his hearers were connected with the truths of the written word. Leading thus from the natural to the spiritual, Christ's parables are links in the chain of truth that unites man with God and earth with heaven. All right, so she's <coughs> uh, repeating and enlarging. The natural, these are the things of man that are used to illustrate the things of God. These are the things of earth that he used to teach the things of heaven. Um, a, a, a basic example of this, you know, Christ's parable is the illustration of a shepherd and his sheep. When we look at a, the, Christ likens the relationship of a shepherd and his flock to, to the relationship between us. us, him and his church, right? And in order to understand what that illustration means, what it is teaching, this, its spiritual significance, right? Uh, we must observe what? The natural, right? We must, you know, as you see a shepherd and his sheep and you understand that interaction, what that looks like, it is, you know, we gain insight on the nature of the relationship between us, us and Christ. When you look at a shepherd, his job is what? It's to keep his flock intact, right? Yes. It's to protect it from predators, to feed the flock, and to tend to all its other needs. Right? That's the shepherd's... Um, occupation. And when you look at the characteristics of sheep, you know, we don't, generally speaking, live around uh, sheep and, 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 and livestock, but you can look online and right, go to Google and find out what, what are sheep like, you know. And when you look at the characteristics of sheep in terms of their behavior, um, they're very social animals. They become agitated. They, 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 it's not healthy for them to be alone. Right? They have a tendency to follow. When one moves, the rest follow. They have this herding behavior. Right? And it's protective. Because they, they, they are prey animals. Right? So their only protection is to come close together. You know? Um, they're wary of strangers and will often flee when approached, and they're accustomed to following their shepherd. Right? Their tendency to follow one another often gets them into trouble. Right? Like in, in, I read this thing in Portugal, there was a, an instance where one sheep tried to cross uh, a stream, you know, that had, was um, ba overflowing, basically, and the current was too strong. And the sheep tried to cross, and it was swept away, and all the others followed. 
<laughs> is something like 500 sheep died just like that, following, following a fellow sheep, right? Um, so when you, when you look at a, a, a someone in the time of Christ, the people who Christ was speaking to, these were daily, they were very familiar with, with these, these animals, they were very familiar with the things that Christ was using as illustrations. So you can imagine how evocative it was for them when, when, he, when he presented these as representations of um, his relationship with his church, his relationship to them as his flock. And, you know, when we look at the characters of sheep, we gain insight on ourselves, right? Right? <laughs> you know, there's a tendency to follow man. There's, you know, even to our detriment and, and so on and so forth. So we see that Christ used natural things as mediums to illustrate um, the spiritual, to teach spiritual truths, to give spiritual insight. But as we continue with Christ's object lessons, paragraph 18.1, um, there's an important principle that we need to put in place. Before we do, Douglas. I uh, just wanted to confirm to think with regards to, I think it's Ephesians chapter 6, chapter 2, verse 6. Mm -hmm. uh, that says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay. So Christ is coming and is. Okay, I guess just thought you're, yeah. All right, no, thanks for sharing. Um, before we move on to page 18, um, let's unpack a, a, um, a visual that Ellen White gives us in this paragraph. She says, leading thus from the natural to the spiritual, Christ's parables are links in the chain of truth that unites man with God and earth with heaven. So if we look at this visual, right, we have this, this is earth. Sorry, I realize because of the angle, things are right are. <laughs> we have earth. And we have heaven. And what do we have in between? There is a, a chasm, a great gulf fixed. We cannot go here. And yeah, we cannot go there. I think heaven can come down, yes? Well, anyway. We need to understand the things of heaven. And the parables we're told are the links in a chain, right? Um, these are the parables. Are the links in a chain that unite earth with heaven and man with God? We need to come, in order to be fitted for heaven, we need to come to a knowledge of the things of heaven. And the mechanism, the vehicle for that, are the parables. 
right? Um, when we look at this illustration, it is very similar to another one that is presented in God's Word, right? Is there any other, is there anywhere in God's Word where you see earth and heaven and the mechanism connecting the two? Jacob's ladder, yes. We have also the illustration of Jacob's ladder. Right? And who is the ladder? Right? Christ is the ladder. I'm saying that these are parallel illustrations, right? As Christ is the ladder, parables are the, ch as Christ is the ladder linking man to heaven, man to God, parables are the links in the chain uniting earth with heaven. So, parables we can understand, they are, they are Christ. If Christ is the ladder, he is also the chain. So what's the significance of this? What does this representation mean as you break it down in your mind? You say parables are Christ. What is that? What is the significance of that? This, this thing. Yes. Okay, so you bring out the point that Christ is the only way to heaven, yes. right? So therefore, what for us now, in order, in order to come to a right knowledge of heavenly things, in order to be saved, the parables are the only way, right? The only means or methodology by which that can be. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. You know, a lot of people get touchy when you start saying uh, this, that, or the other has to be understood for salvation. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Bible, I think you can see that the Bible backs up the statement that the parables are, in essence, the way to heaven. They, they represent Christ. Mm -hmm. um, when the covenant is first given, what do we see? We see a parable given. You have circumcision. In the Christian era, what do you have for salvation? You have to be baptized to be saved. Mm -hmm. Baptism is nothing more than another parable. So you see it with the, the Old Testament, you see it with the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But most people wouldn't look at it that way. Yeah, I mean, that's a solemn thought. You know, and and there is, I mean, it's a reframing of a concept that we've taught, but it's being reframed in language that's closer to to the Bi to 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 the Bible, because what have we taught? We've taught that the latter rain 
is communicated how? Prophetic line upon prophetic line. Right? And if you're not receiving God's word, prophetic line, prophetic line, you're not receiving the latter rain. And you'll be lost. You won't be prepared as an Adventist anyway. That's how God is communicating to us, right? Um, as an Adventist, you're not receiving God's word, prophetic line upon prophetic line, which is the latter rain, which are the communications of the Holy Spirit, you'll not be prepared for the coming crisis and you're going to be lost, right? Uh, this is now framing it. It's, it's the same concept. <laughs> Look, parables, parables are the means by which we come to a knowledge of, of heavenly things, right? Furthermore, parables are Christ himself, and no one is going to heaven without a knowledge of Christ. Right? So it's the same concept packaged differently. Right? The same truth that we've, we've taught packaged um, differently. Any other thoughts on the significance of that when we say parables equals Christ? I find something that is interesting with the development of parable teaching is uh, as, as it is a re, re, it's reframing our message, right? As the message has developed, we've developed a, a body of concepts. We've developed a, a language, right? It's, it's become its own science with its own language around those concepts and how those concepts work, right? We have all these abbreviations that looks like the, the, the what do you call that table, that chemistry table? Periodic. The periodic table. You know, you have, you have NH, you have all these things, and we have SC, we have COP, we have TOE, you know. It's its own science. But now with parable teaching, it, it's being uh, reframed more, more closely in the language of the scriptures, right? I, I don't know if you get what I'm saying, yeah. if you see that. And I think God is doing that to prepare us to, 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 to bring these, these truths to the Levites. Right? Um, in any case, Christ Object Lessons, page 18, the next point. It says, <clears throat> in his teaching from nature, Christ was speaking of the things which his own hands had made and which had qualities and powers he himself had imparted. In the original perfection, all created things were an expression of the thought of God. To Adam and Eve in their Eden home, nature was full of the knowledge of God, teeming with divine instruction. Uh, wisdom spoke to the eye and was received into the heart, for they communed with God in his created works. As soon as the holy pair transgressed the law of the Most High, the brightness from the face of God departed from the face of nature. The earth is now marred and defiled by sin. Here's the key point. It says, yet even in its blighted state, much that is beautiful remains. God's object lessons are not obliterated. Rightly understood, nature speaks of her creator. Right? Um, so what is the truth uh, that we glean from there? That uh, in the original perfection of, hang on. Okay, even after the fall, right, God has preserved within nature, within the natural qualities that allow us to understand uh, you know, spiritual truths, right? Because some may say, um, well, look, you know, uh, the world is fallen, animals eat each other, <laughs> you know, how can we, is it, can we reliably look to nature, 
to, to teach us of heavenly things. And here, Supreme Prophecy is telling us that uh, notwithstanding uh, the fall, God has preserved within nature, he's preserved enough of it to, that we are able to, to, to use it to understand. Uh, the natural still illustrates the spiritual, notwithstanding the fall. Um, okay, natural illustrating the spiritual. Yes. Uh, I like the, the part of the, in the last sentence that says God's object lessons are not obliterated. Yes. Uh, you know, you think of archaeology and things that are that are old. You know, created long ago. Mm -hmm. The earth was created long ago, and they're worn. There's lots of things that are unworn, but what's on them isn't necessarily obliterated. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, if you look at it like that, that helps us to understand why. It's so hard for us to get the lessons out of nature. Um, they're there, but maybe we don't spend enough time looking at it, trying to to see around the, the worn edges of sin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's why Christ gave us the word, because we, we, we were duller and the world was dull because of sin, but it's, it's nice to see it right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not obliterated. Yeah, that's a nice illustration. Archaeology, you know, those ancient tablets, they're worn, but they're still there. They're still, you know, accessible to present the information that was uh, set on them. Um, the question then is, what does this look like in God's Word, operationalized in God's Word? When we say the natural illustrates the spiritual, what must we consider? Now, I know we've watched at least I'm sure most of us have watched presentations on Illustration makes sense. Um, so, as we study God's word and we allow the natural to illustrate the spiritual, um, we say natural. We come to a passage and we want to identify the natural. We want to identify the natural. What does that entail? What goes into that? Because we must identify the natural in order to understand um, the spiritual. So the natural, I'll also, uh, I'll, I'll add this word because it might help us to, um, to better understand. The literal. Because we know that all these passages, what's the principle that we're presented with? That these words are speaking more for? For our time. They have spiritual significance for us now. But when we uh, read them, right, we know that there was a a literal human being, right? 
who are speaking these words and they're speaking these words at a specific point in time in the history of humanity and they were speaking to specific people these messages were directed to um, a spe specific nations right or a specific nation and these and their messages had um, a specific meaning to the people to whom they were being spoken to at that time right so all that is true but we know that those very same words they have spiritual significance for us at the end of the world it's the spiritual significance that we want to understand but in order to understand the spiritual significance of those words we must first understand the natural or the literal what did it initially mean right uh, when the prophet spoke these words who was he speaking them to when was he speaking and what did they mean to the people that they were uh, given to right we must first identify the literal or the natural right so um, this is in contrast to how we have how we have generally applied as a matter of practice how we have applied or approached God's word up to now right what have we done up to now right we've done a lot of direct proof texting which means basically you you um, take a passage you want to understand its spiritual or prophetic significance right and you see a symbol within that passage such as a you know um, the archers right the archers Josiah is shot at by archers is it Josiah? Is it Josiah isn't who was the one who was shot at by archers? at the battle of Carchemish He was, what, shot? he was shot at by archers. Oh, by archers. It was Josiah. Come on, Bible student. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Josiah. Anyway, he was. Uh, yes? Yes, and he died being shot at by archers. It was Josiah, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Sorry, second guessing myself. So, um, and we would, we, that's an example. And it would be like, Josiah, uh, we'd be like, okay, Josiah is the, he's the king of, of, uh, of Judah. Therefore, he represents the leadership of Adventism. And he's shot at by archers, archers, Islam. You know what I mean? We'll just do direct proof texting like that you know king like that archers you find proof text you you, you you find archers associated with ishmael and so on so like okay that's islam that's what it means we do a lot of just direct proof texting but we hadn't taken time to understand the the uh context historic context right which is, you know, um, when was this message being spoken? What was happening at the time it was spoken? Josiah was given a warning. You know, what did this more, what was the import of that warning to the people who were hearing it at that time? You know, we then say that that warning is is this message that you know that is rejected by the leadership of Adventism but that's not what that message meant to jo to Josiah in that time I you get it right so we skip we would skip the step of understanding the natural before trying to make deductions about what the spiritual significance of a passage is right so now what parable teaching is calling us to do, it's calling us to 
paint that picture, flesh out the natural, that we may correctly understand um, the spiritual. I'll, I'll put a number of, uh, I'll put another word here. Setting. When we're seeking to understand the passage, we must identify the setting of the uh, passage that we want to understand. And what goes into understanding the setting? It's the when, right? Big one. The setting. Oh, uh, the someone help. Yes, the the surrounding, the environment, right? Um, like here, when the setting of this classroom. Right? This classroom is a setting. And what's in this setting? There are tables, there are chairs, there's a whiteboard. Right? So when you look at the setting, it's the when. Yes? So, so like in the Bible, you find a passage which deals with a message coming to somebody. Right? Mm -hmm. What was going on when that message came? You know, yes. What, what, what were the circumstances that made that message come? Yes. Yes. Um, let me not frame it that way. With setting, another way of framing it is historic context. The historic context. Okay, so in order to, I, to, to paint the picture of the setting or to identify the historic context, what must we, what information do we need, right? Because we've said that the, the historic context is, it's what did the message, when was the message being spoken? Who was it literally being spoken to? And what did it mean to the people to whom it was literally being spoken to, right? What information do we need to paint that picture. Okay. To paint the context. What information do we need? The uh, actual location where the thing happened. Like the, ge the geographic location. Okay, so where do you get that information? Um, that would, where do I get that? Mm -hmm. But I mean, you'll get it in the Bible, okay? Does the Bible give you all the information that you need? Does the Bible give you all the information that you need? No. Where else would you go? Okay. My sister, yes, I'm coming. You go to the Bible. You said uh, spirit of prophecy. Does the Bible spirit of prophecy give you all the information that you need? The history, history books. Also. History, right? Google. <laughs> yeah, Google. We could put Google for Technology. all these things, all these things, right? So Bible, because you can find the Bible in Google, spirit of prophecy in Google history books in Google. When you come to histories, I will say um, our primary source, or initial source rather, is, is the pioneers. They present very sound information on a lot of the, on a lot of the sacred histories that we handle. But we can also look at other histories. such as the Antiquities of Josephus, mm -hmm. 
such as um, what else? Um, Antiquities of Josephus. Uh, another, another, you know, historians. I'll also put uh, chronologies, although these are closely associated with the histories, such as uh, Annals of the World by James Usher. Annals of the World. A W N A L S of the World. Right, and, and other chronologies. So these are the sources of information that we can, that we have available to us in order to um, identify the historic context. Right? Yes? Wouldn't you want to put on, well, I mean, wouldn't you want to put away chronologies, Theodore's chronologies? Yeah. Uh, I mean, theater has a lot of sound information on chronology. I just say that because of when, when, we, when you list pioneers before other histories, Pioneers just took the history that was available and yes. put it to where it's easier for us to find. And that's mm -hmm. what Theodore's done. I mean, uh, y y there's there's a lot of good information. I mean, he has a a paper on the chronology of the Babylonian captivity. I was looking at that. You know, lots of very good information in there, and uh, and you know, obviously some other papers. He also has a paper on Leviticus 26. You know, so you can. Look to that for help. Yes. Where would you put um, the modern histories, just with other histories, like the ones that Sister Tess pulls from? Oh, well, yes. World War Two would be past the pioneers. So that's yes, that's, that's modern histories. That's other histories, right? Uh, other histories. It's not you know non-Adventist historians, ancient and modern, basically. Um, Okay, so th this is the information that we need in order to frame the historic context, which is the natural. So when you are identifying the historic context, right, what you are, what you are doing is, and when you're identifying the, the historic context, which is the natural, what you are doing is identifying the original intent of a passage. This is another important concept, original intent, right? So we have natural, which is historic context, which is the original intent. what the passage meant to those who, who were hearing it, right? So I understand that concept, original intent. And when you identify the original intent of a passage, you come to realize that the way we have interpreted many passages in God's Word um, is not the original intent. When you go to a passage and you identify its historic context, what it meant to the people who are hearing it, what it literally meant in its historic context, you realize that the way we interpret many passages um, is not um, what it originally meant, right? So you're forced to distinguish between the original intent and application. There are passages that we apply in certain ways, right? When we look at Leviticus 26 and we identify a time prophecy spanning 25, 20 years, that's how we are applying it. But those words in Leviticus 26, what did they mean? when Moses gave them to the Jews, right? Was it identifying a time prophecy of 2,520 years? You know, no it was not, right? It meant something else to the people in that time, right? So we're forced to distinguish between the original intent of a passage and the application. 
What have we done up to now? We've conflated. We've made application, but we've not distinguished between original intent and application, right? So our Adventist uh, brothers, we would come to, to, with, with them saying, Leviticus 26, this is a 2520, right? And we're saying, and we'd, this is what the passage means, right? And they would say, no, that's not what it means. It's dealing with intensity, not duration, you know? And we would say, no, it's dealing with duration, right? We're making application of the passage. But we weren't, just, we weren't making that point that, listen, this is an application. An application can be correct, right? An application can be correct. William Miller made application of Leviticus 26, and it is correct. Spirit of Prophecy endorses that application. It, it, not directly of Leviticus 26, but in other ways, she, she endorses that application. And it is correct. But it's not the original intent. Yes? So I don't want to get off on the sidetrack, but just a question for, uh, on original intent. With Leviticus 26, um, I understood that it was fulfilled with the uh, time frame before and after the Jews going into ca captivity. Seven times, seven times, seven times. Yes. Okay. So isn't that still duration? Um. Because it mentioned seven times and it was 70 years. Seven times and 70 years. Seven times and 70 years. I'm just curious. Um, well, as it was fulfilled with the Jews, I mean, it was dealing, I guess, principally with escalating judgments that they, that they suffered. And you can trace the escalation of those judgments, you know, from each mention of seven times. Um, when we look at the original, we can see both duration and, and um, in, in intensity. But it's not dealing with 2520, right? And um, we're going to look at a number of illustrations. Um, now, when I, I looked at Leviticus 26, and it's already recorded, it's on the public record, maybe some of you have seen it. So I may go to other illustrations before coming to this one, so that, you know, if you've already seen the study I presented on Leviticus 26 as, as a presentation of original intent versus application, it won't be redundant. Um, yeah, but there are many others we can look at. Yes? So, so with regards to parable, uh -huh. uh, parable teaching, then the original intent kind of dictates the way we make the application? Yes, it guides the application. Yes. The original intent must must guide the application. So if you already made an application it completely it was without taking into account the original intent in the case of the twenty five client. Yeah, you skipped a step. You, you skipped a step. Mm -hmm. So that means you don't really need the original intent if you can make the application. Because I know we are all very quick to try to make application to scale. You have to have the original intent. Because, um, as we're going to see, maybe we'll go through Leviticus 26 quickly, right? But, <clears throat> no, we'll go through Joel. We, we can show through Joel that um, when you skip that step, when you don't identify the original intent, you can make mistakes in application, right? That's the danger. You can, you know. Um, you can make dangerous mistakes in application, right? But when you identify the original intent and you allow the original intent to guide your application, you can have much greater confidence that the application that you're arriving at is correct. Right. Um, so, with this, co with this parameter of natural illustrating the spiritual, we're forced to identify original intent in distinction from application. And for many of us, we've not understood that 
there's a difference. We've not distinguished, right? Um, but as we said, identifying the original intent and allowing the original intent to guide the application allows us to arrive at more robust conclusions regarding what God's Word teaches. We have a bit of time, and there's a quick example that, that, uh, that I'd like us to, to look at where we see, we read a passage one way, but that certainly is not its original intent. It, also, you see that Christ in many things that he said, many things that, many scriptures as they're presented in the New Testament, right, are not the original intent, right, but applications of those given passages. When we look at the prophecy of Isaiah, um, is Isaiah 46? Where it says, you know, a, a star shall, a star shall, um, let's find it. No, it's, it's not Isaiah. It's, it's Balaam's prophecy. Sorry, I'm sorry. Balaam. Numbers 24, verse 17. It says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab. You know, and who, who, what is that talking about? It says Christ, right? But that was, that's an application of the passage, right? There's an original intent, right? That must be identified. Um, why is the identification of original intent important? Because the identification of original intent can lead us to, uh, as we identify the original intent, it can lead us to present truth applications, light on present truth that we otherwise would not see. Do you get that? Right? And we're going to see examples of that. Great buildings in New York, this is the only example, and then we'll, we'll close. Uh, let's find that passage, that Spirit of Prophecy passage. The passage about the great buildings in New York. July 5, 1906, paragraph 14. No, uh, no, sorry, this isn't the one. There are two passages that we use to, in connection with, um, that we locate at 9 11. There are two passages. There's, there's this one about the great buildings in New York. <coughs> Beg your pardon? Okay. see because we discussed it in Arkansas let me just open my notes from back there and see if I can find it
Big one? Great buildings in New York. I think that's the one. Okay. LS? Live sketches, yeah? Oh, no, the, the one we're doing, um, Test Movies Volume 9, I think. 90. She says 90 page 12. Sorry? It says, on one occasion, when in New York City I was in the night season, called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify their owners and builders. Higher and still higher, these buildings arose and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belonged were not asking themselves, how can we best glorify God? The Lord was not in their thoughts. I thought, oh, that those who are thus investing their means could see their course as God sees it. They are piling up magnificent buildings, but how foolish in the sight of the ruler of the universe is their planning and devising. They are not studying with all their powers of heart and mind how they might glorify God. They have lost sight of this, the first duty of man. Um, as these lofty buildings went up, the owners rejoiced with ambitious pride that they had money to use in gratifying self and provoking the envy of their neighbors. Much of the money that they thus invested had been obtained through exaction, through grinding down the poor. They forgot that in heaven an account of every business transaction is kept. Every unjust deal, every fraudulent act is there recorded. The time is coming when in their fraud and insolence men will reach a point that the Lord will not permit them to pass and they will learn that there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. The scenes that next passed before me was, a, was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe but these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. Their fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. Their firemen were unable to operate the engines. Um, and when we read this passage, uh, we connect it with life sketches, right? And where do we place it? We place it at 9-11, right? But when we read this passage, within its context, maybe I'll ask us to do that, R read the entire chapter and see, is it, is it talking about 9-11 or is there, yes? On what? Yes, the great bills in New York. That's the one I was about to read, but oh, I didn't. That's right. So we've taken this passage and other passages and made application to 9-11. But when we read the passages in their um, context, right, realize that as she wrote it, that's not necessarily what she was talking about, right? So parable teaching is, it, it, it's calling us to clarify, that to, to, to distinguish when we are looking at the original intent or when we're making application. And this is important because when we look at the original intent, it can lead us to present truth applications which uh, we wouldn't otherwise see, right? Plus it's more honest right? when dealing with people that we're trying to reach, when dealing with our fellow Adventist brethren, uh, to be able to, to, to see and say you know, uh, uh, that we're looking at application versus original intent.
It's it's no, uh, it's a correct application I think because we do see those things fulfilled at 9/11, but it's not the original intent. It's not what the passage literally means or originally means, right? It's like Leviticus 26 when we say it's the 2520. You know we're making application. It's a correct application, but that's not what it literally means. That's not what it means. The prophecy of Balaam, you know, even the scriptures say it's talking about Christ, but you can identify a historic fulfillment of that in the time period around that history when Balaam gave it. There's a fulfillment of it there, right? So when you look at the time of Christ now, that's an application. It's a correct application, right? So um, it's just being clear about what you're doing, right? Uh, because conflating the two has led us to make some mistakes, right? So you have to know what you're doing. Um, there is a really, we're going to look at the, is it uh, the prophecy of Balaam? No, no, no. We're going to look at Isaiah 7, right? Not today, <laughs> Look at, but Isaiah 7, there's the prophecy that, uh, um, I say, that a, a child will be born and his name will be called Emmanuel, right? And um, who is that talking about? That's application. It's applied to Jesus. But you can see a fulfillment of it in, the, in Isaiah's time right in that history it's not originally talking about Christ right it, it's 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 talking about someone else right the prophecy of Emmanuel and we're going to look at it we're going to paint we're going to paint the setting identify the historic context and that's going to guide us to see who was it talking about originally right and identifying that will then it, it paints a picture right that we can then use to make a present truth application and would have never seen that present truth application had we not identified the original intent. And what I understand is that they can give you the all view because sometimes you're looking at applications, but we can have more than one way of looking at it. So it's not like the Sorry, repeat that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> when you just spoke, what I understand that sometimes um, you go straight to the application. Yes. But when we, you really take time to go to the original intent, mm -hmm. you. Sometimes God gives you information, mm -hmm. but you take only one part. But because you take really time to understand all He wants to understand in original essence, you can understand all things. Um, I just think about Miriam's yes. story mm -hmm. when they uh, they understand something, but they have some mistake. Mm -hmm. When you don't look at original intent, you're more prone to making mistakes. And when you look at the original intent, I won't say you understand all that it means in your application, because a passage can have more than one application when you look at present truth. But you can come to more correct applications. Right? You can come to more correct applications. Or correct applications. More often. Folks, okay, so it's 7.15, and uh, this introduction is done, and we're going to start working through illustrations. We're going to look at Joel, we're going to look at Isaiah 7, and we may get to the prophecy of Balaam as well. 
it, it's also interesting. It, this opens up like a whole new world, right? A whole new world in the Bible, you know, that you hadn't seen before. So now you're going back over all these passages. What's the, what's the original intent? You go apply the tools of parable teaching, and all manner of new light starts opening up. So it's a blessing. Um, let's go to the prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this day of preparation. Um, Lord, help us to set all things in order in preparation for the blessed hours of the Sabbath as they come to us uh, tonight, as we, um, and as we enjoy them tomorrow. Lord, we thank you for bringing us, Lord, just about to the close of this first week. It's been a blessing. Lord, we ask that you may bring Parminda safely, um, that he may uh, travel well and uh, join us later today. We look forward to seeing him. And um, please keep us now as we uh, break and as we head for breakfast. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.